Good morning, Gateway Bible Church. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you this morning. Would you please turn in your scriptures to Luke chapter 10? We are beginning in verse 38. We are completing Luke chapter 10, five verses, as we continue in our sermon series, Destiny Revealed. Give you just a few seconds to find that in your Bible. Luke chapter 10, verse 38. And while we are on our way there, I would just ask that you would just enter into a time of surrender. Surrender yourselves to the Lord and His will here for us this morning, and we're going to do that through prayer. Would you bow your, bow your heads and bow your hearts? Father, we, we come humbly before you this morning. We thank you that you have placed us in this posture of worship. We're in this posture of worship because you have loved us. You have saved us. You have redeemed us from this world. You have secured our place in eternity with you. Lord, you have given us your word, your will for our lives. We thank you that it's revealed here this morning. And Lord, uh, we know that we can't move forward at all without your Holy Spirit here. So bless us this morning. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our title for this morning's sermon is One Thing is Needed. One thing is uh, needed. That's the message that Jesus has for each one of us this morning. Um, Of course, in these five verses, we are looking at the story of Mary and Martha. Five verses. So, I'm going to start with a question. What would you do if Jesus was coming to your house for dinner? What would you do if Jesus was coming to your house for dinner? (laughs) Would you clean the place up? Would you get out your best tablecloths? Would you get out your best china? Would you uh, wipe the spots off your glasses? What about food? Would you give him that old top ramen that you eat a couple times a week? Or would you get... Was it kosher? I didn't know there was such a thing as kosher top ramen. Oh, there you go. Uh, Or would you give him your filet mignon? Um, Martha and Mary must have been contemplating these exact same things. The Messiah is coming to visit. And Jesus sent out his 70 to them. They received them. They received Jesus. And the message is Jesus is coming. These sisters that lived there must have been ecstatic, and they decided to pull out all the stops. We don't know too much about their personalities. We're not told. But one thing uh, we do know, and that is Martha, Martha has the gift of hospitality. She has that wonderful gift of hospitality. On two separate occasions, the scriptures declare that she received Jesus, she welcomed Jesus, and she showed hospitality to our Lord. There is no doubt here that she is the one who takes charge. She takes charge of all of these preparations. No doubt she planned the celebration for days, if not weeks. We don't know how long. She's wondering, what are we going to cook? What's the place going to look like? But it is in these next five verses that we learn that even the wonderful, the biblical gift of hospitality must never pull us away from the one thing that is needed. And that is communion with our Lord Jesus. Amen? Now, these verses, they teach us to identify the one thing that is most important in our life. What will be number one? In other words, what has the highest rank in our life? What has the highest position in our life? What has supremacy in our life? 
Where are our priorities? And that's why Luke includes this story in this narrative. Paul, the apostle, says it like this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, where he says, I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. One thing, and it begins, all of this begins by hearing his word. One thing is needed. One thing is needed, not two things, not three things. Question, how many of you like things simple? How many of you like things simple? It's not for everybody. Some of you like things that are complex. I want to tell you, I like things that are simple. And there is a tremendous beauty. There is a tremendous wisdom found in the simplicity of these next five verses. So, we're going to pull them apart. Piece by piece, word by word, as we go through these verses. Uh, let's begin, starting in verse 38, where Martha welcomes Jesus into her home. It says in verse 38 of chapter 10, Now it happened, as they went, that he entered a certain village. And a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. It says, um, now it happened as they went. They are on the way. Remember that in Luke chapter 9, the narrative of the Gospel of Luke takes a completely different turn. Look what it says in Luke 9, 51. Now it came to pass, when the time had come for him to be received up, that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. So it's been about six months, or rather there is about six months left in the life and in the ministry of Jesus Christ on this earth. It has been a couple of months, maybe two or three months, since they left the Galilee region, and Jesus now says, we're turning our face to Jerusalem. Remember this, he sent out the 70, two by two, 35 pairs, to go into all of the cities that were on Jesus' itinerary to prepare the way for the Messiah. And so now, Luke has each one of us journeying with Jesus on this uh, journey. His destiny is revealed in Jerusalem. And what does it say here in verse 38? They enter a certain village. Now, it doesn't say the name of the village, but we know what the name of that village is. It is Bethany. It's a place that Jesus will visit often. It's very close to Jerusalem. It's a little less than two miles away. Jesus stays there in his final week on this earth. He stays, he stays there. It's on the eastern slope on the Mount of Olives. Today, uh, it's called El Arizaya. And that's sort of a, a form of the name Lazarus, uh, Lazarus, interestingly enough. Now, this may have been the first time that Jesus visits Bethany. We don't really know. It looks at it. But what we do know is that he's going to visit Bethany several times from now on. Now... They enter a certain village, and in that certain village is a certain woman. And we're not left to guess who this woman is. It's Martha. And I like Martha and her name for a couple of reasons. Number one, this is the only Martha in all of scriptures, as opposed to Mary. There are a lot of Marys in scripture, and sometimes it's hard to uh, keeping track of them all. Martha was the mistress of this house in Bethany, which included her sister Mary and her brother Lazarus. Now, she's likely the oldest of the three because she's always mentioned first in order, and that was a very common thing to do for the oldest sibling. We don't, it doesn't appear that she's married. We see nothing of her husband. 
She's living in this house with her sister and her brother. She's less famous. She's less famous than Lazarus because everybody remembers Lazarus. He's raised from the dead. She's less famous than her sister Mary who, if you remember, uh, took that extremely expensive perfume and poured it on Jesus' feet later on in another visit and then took her hair and wiped his uh, feet with her hair. The fact is that Jesus loved all three of them. They were close. He loves Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. Look what it says in John chapter 11, verse 5. It says, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. They are close. Now what else does it say in verse 38 about Martha? What else do we know here? She welcomes him into their house. Now most likely, understand this, by this time they are believers. The 70 have gone out. They went into this village and they were received. You remember the instructions, right? Go into the village. If they receive you, if they welcome you, stay there. Stay in that house. They were excited to have the master at the house. And notice here in verse 38, just whose house it was. It was her house. And that's going to become very clear. Now, uh, there's no doubt that Martha is in control here. When you read this uh, narrative here found in Luke chapter 10, and then you go to John, and then a, a subsequent uh, narrative that's found in John chapter 11, you're going to notice that that's her house. Martha, the name Martha means mistress in Aramaic. She is the mistress of this house. She is the female master. And whenever Jesus visited, Martha bore the responsibility of welcoming, of serving, of meeting with them. Now, we know, Luke tells us, that there is at least one other inhabitant in this house at that time. And that's revealed in verse 39. In verse 39, Luke says, She, Martha, had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Martha has a sister. And Mary, Martha's sister, is not described very much, this particular Mary, in all of Scripture. We don't know much about her, but what we do know is that she becomes the central character in this story. She becomes the model. She becomes our model. Now, what do we know about Mary? Verse 39 simply says that she sat at Jesus' feet. She sat at Jesus' feet. Luke doesn't say anything about her personality. All Luke tells us is that when Jesus came into the house, she is there listening to Jesus' words sitting at his feet. Now, remember this. Jesus' mission. What is Jesus' mission here on the earth? To bring people into the kingdom. To bring people into his kingdom. And the primary vehicle that he uses to make that happen is teaching. He taught. He taught wherever he went. He taught around the Lake of Galilee. He taught in a boat. He taught in the middle of a town. He taught. He taught. He taught. He taught in a synagogue, and he taught in the house. This isn't the first time that he does it, and it will not be the last. What did he teach? He taught about himself. He taught about himself. Who he was, the revelation as the Son of Man, the light of the world. And, and where's Mary? She's at the uh, feet of Jesus, uh, Jesus. Now notice in verse 39, she's not only listening to his word, she's at his feet. That is extraordinary. That in itself is extraordinary. Why? Because women were not allowed 
to, to, hold, to sit at that position of a, of a rabbi's feet. They had their, at that time, particular place of learning, and it was in the back. You want to learn? Go to the woman's section. So, there she is. And Mary's posture tells us everything. Sitting there at the feet of Jesus, it tells us everything. It tells us that she had a passion for his teaching. It tells us that she wants to get as close to the master as humanly possible. She's literally glued to Jesus. And she's hearing his word. She's sitting there at his feet, and she's hearing his word. Mary knows the teaching of Jesus. Jesus says this, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God, or by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, can I get an amen? Permit me to preach. I want to preach. What a privilege it is to hear God's word. The most important reality in the world is to hear the truth of God. Amen? That's true for non-believers, obviously. But it's also true for believers as well. But I know so many believers, I know so many Christians who don't understand how important this is to hear the Word of God. I know so many churches that exist today that don't know how important this is. And this is exactly why Luke, through the direction of the Holy Spirit, sees it necessary to include this story which is seemingly out of place in this narrative, these five verses. The most important thing for all Christians is to hear the revealed word of God, the truth of God. Why? Why? Because everything else hinges upon it. Everything else is subordinate to it. Everything else is affected by it. Family problems? Don't raise your hand. Family problems? I'll raise my hand. Go to the scriptures. The answers are there. Work problems. Relationship problems. How's your attitude? Are you stressed? Do you have worries? Go to the scriptures. Go sit at the feet of Jesus Christ and hear his words, and I guarantee you, you will experience change. Now, Mary understood. She understood those words of Christ. She understood Luke chapter 8, verse 21, where Jesus replies, My mother and my brother are these who hear the word of God and do it. She had a desire to hear the word of God. She she grasped this amazing opportunity. God incarnate was in her house, and she's at his feet. She's soaking it all up. She has a number one priority, and that's to hear the truth of God, to respond to the truth of God, to love the truth of God, to obey the truth of God. Some folks get it, and others will not. Even Christians who believe can lose sight of this and become distracted from the word. And friends, this is exactly what happens in verse 40. Luke says in verse 40, but Martha, but Martha was distracted with much serving. And she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care? That my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. Wow. That is amazing. Now, I want us just to remember a couple of things here. Martha 
is not the enemy of the truth of God. She loved Jesus. She believed to Je uh, in Jesus. She was close to Jesus. But she doesn't get it, and Mary does. She missed the opportunity to sit at the Master's feet. What's the problem the Scriptures declare? She is distracted. She is distracted. It's so simple. There's such beauty there. She's distracted. She's fussing around. She's preparing the meal. We need to make sure everything is okay. Where are all these people going to sleep? How much water do we need? What kind of food are we going to serve? What do I need to clean up? She's distracted. And we have to ask ourselves this question. She's distracted from what? She's distracted from hearing the words of the Lord. She is literally pulling herself away from the Messiah. And so what does she do next in verse 40? Well, she approaches Jesus while he is teaching in her living room. I suppose it's the living room. We'll say her living room. Now, it's bad enough that Martha's priorities were messed up. But here's the reality. If your priorities are messed up, something else is soon going to fall. You know what that is? It's your attitude. Your attitude. And it's on full display here, right? Martha loses the joy of serving. Maybe that has happened to some of you at various times in your lives. She's lost the joy of serving. She becomes agitated. It's evident. She becomes frustrated. It's evident here. She becomes mad. It's evident here. So what does she do? She approaches Jesus and she says, Lord, can you just start, stop talking for a minute? Now, I'll let us remind you again. What does she say? Lord? She uses that word in Greek, kurios. Lord? Martha knew Jesus as her Lord. She called him Lord. She called him Master. They are believers. You see, Martha's motives, they are high. They're noble. She wants to serve her guests. She wants to do Jesus this great honor. But she wishes to honor him with service and material things rather than what Mary is doing, which is that spiritual communion with Jesus Christ. So, here comes the accusation. And it gets, gets interesting. Lord, do you not care? Do you not care? which is an astounding thing to think about how many scriptures are in the New Testament alone that talk about the care of our Lord and Savior. The care. This isn't the only time, by the way, that uh, Jesus is accused of not caring. Remember this? When, when Jesus was crossing the Sea of Galilee and that storm and the winds are blowing... And the disciples are in the boat with him, and he begins to freak out a little. They begin to freak out a little bit. And Jesus is reclining on a pillow. He's in a sleep on a, uh, a, 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 on a pillow in the stern. What do they say? Mark uh, chapter 4, verse 38. They woke him up, and they said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And Martha says, What? Do you not care? This is what we call going overboard. Martha has lost it. We can agree on that. She's saying, are you going to just sit there and keep talking about salvation? About transformation? About hope? About peace? About truth? Are you going to ignore the fact, Jesus, that the table is not set yet? And I love this line. This is the apex of this story. 
I love this line. What is it? Tell her to help me. Tell her to help me, Lord. How many of you have ever uttered those words? Can you remember that? In your house. Thank you, Connie. She's the only honest one. How many of you have ever heard those words uttered in your house? Maybe from your daughter or son. Now, I can, I can identify because I, I'm that way. I sometimes can be a, a, a big baby. I, yes. I like to have, I, li I'm not, I don't shy away from work. I'm not that kind of an individual. I work hard. But I like to have, it, it's better for me when somebody else is engaging in that work. I will, I, I like it when Valerie uh, sits with me during the week while I'm preparing for our sermons. Just makes things easier. I can identify. You feel like you're going through it with somebody. Tell her to help me. What's happening? Martha is focusing on the bread that perishes, isn't she? She's focusing on the bread that feeds the body. Mary is focusing on the bread that feeds the soul. Amen? She's lost it. She's gone overboard. She goes all the way to commanding God incarnate. She says, I command you to tell her to help me. She's gone off the reservation. Now, verse 41, Jesus is forced to reply now. Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. Jesus is forced to stop. He's forced to deal with Martha. She bursts into the room. She starts this tirade. She goes off on this rant, and now he's forced. By the way, Martha didn't have to do that. She could have probably sent a note, right? She could have probably stood in the back and made some hand gestures. But she interrupts the whole thing. Now, before we condemn Martha, what is it that keeps us from hearing the word of God? I know so many people that cannot work an hour and a half a week out of their busy schedule to come and do exactly what you are doing here this morning, sitting at the feet of Jesus. and hearing the word of God. There are so many Christians who, who can't, I, 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 I got to tell you, I see this all the time, and their lives are so full of worry, so full of problems, but when I ask them, are you doing a daily devotional? Are you in your scriptures? Are you hearing? Are you sitting at the feet of Jesus and hearing his word? Well, no, not really. And they wonder, wonder why there's so much worry, why there's so much stress, why there's so much uh, strife. What are the things that occupy us on Sunday mornings or at other times when we could be sitting at the feet of Jesus? Now, Jesus is clear. He says those things, those are the things that distract us. Those are the things that make us more frustrated, more agitated, more worried, more troubled. I love hearing the word of God. That's just a central part of my life. I have plenty of imperfections, but I love hearing the font of wisdom and truth that comes from God's word. But I know many Marthas, and I know many Marys. Don't allow yourself to get taken away by all the unnecessary things. They only lead to greater frustration. So... Here comes this gentle, gentle, gentle rebuke. What does Jesus say? Martha, Martha. Martha, Martha. That's, that's a picture of gentleness. That's a picture of grace. That's a picture of tenderness. I got to tell you, if it was me, I most likely, because of all of my serious shortcomings, would not have been so tender and gentle. 
I probably would have said, sit down and shut up. That's probably what I would say. But Jesus is tender with her. Still a rebuke, but a gentle rebuke. He says, Martha, you are worried. You are troubled. It was good to do what she did, but not then. Not when it was time to hear the word of God. So please understand this. Service is necessary. Service is a beautiful thing. But when service becomes the source of our distraction, the source of our anxiety, the source of our worry, what's the cure? Shut up and sit down. That's it. The cure is to sit down at the feet of Jesus in that wonderful solitude and communion with him. I was thinking of alternate titles for the sermon this morning and I thought this would have been a good one don't just do something sit there don't do don't just do something sit there now verse 42 Mary Jesus declares chooses the right thing in verse 42 Jesus says, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. One thing, not two things, not three things. What's that one thing? Hearing the word of the Lord. Hearing God's word. And Mary has chosen. She's chosen that good part. That's a specific word in Greek. Eklegomai. And it means chosen. It, but it's a little bit more. It means chosen for oneself and chosen for one's own benefit. So, so the Lord is saying, this is, this is not up to me. This is on you. You can choose this for your benefit. You and I can lose sight of who we are very easily. But more importantly, you and I can lose sight of whose we are very easily. Amen? This is what Jesus is talking about. The good things in life. Family, friends, jobs, relationships. relationships. Even good works. Even good works can choke out the life in us. So Jesus says we must choose that good part. We must choose Him, His presence. That must be our primary focus. And when we do that, we find that Jesus is the key to everything. Our lives get better. We choose that for our own benefit. We will find, you will find, that the stress, the worries of this modern world will dissipate. It will have less hold on us. J Jesus says only one thing is needed. Most of us are so full of unnecessary things. And here in the Scriptures is a remedy. Those unnecessary things, Jesus says, says, have the capacity to govern us, the capacity to mess us up. The non-essentials can ruin our attitudes, our relationships. Only one thing is needed, Jesus says. Nothing is better than hearing the word of the Lord. Nothing's, n nothing's that important. Nothing compares. Amen? Now, finally, Jesus ends this conversation, this gentle rebuke to Martha with these words. He says, one thing, Martha, is needed. And Mary has chosen that good part. And he says this, which will not be taken away from her. Mary has chosen the best part. And Jesus says, I'm not going to take that away from her. I'm not going to send her out into the kitchen. It's not going to happen. That would not be appropriate. That notion is ridiculous, Jesus says. It's very clear. Now, Please understand this. When Jesus says that, he's not only saying that to Martha. I'm not sending your, your, your sister out in the kitchen to, to help you. 
He's speaking to us as well. He's saying that that's the one thing that will never be taken away. In other words, there is an eternality to the words of God. It is the one thing that when we leave this world, we will take with us. Everything else will fade away. Everything else is transitory. Now, I want to end with this scripture from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 6, which we read this morning, which speaks precisely about the word never being taken away. It says, all flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, because the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers. The flower fades, but the word of our Lord stands forever. Amen? Isn't that a wonderful exhortation? We need to be at the feet of Jesus Christ listening to his words. Not just here on Sunday, but on a daily basis. It's the source of your strength. It's the source of your power, your inspiration. It's the source of your continuation. And we rob ourselves when that's not happening. Would you close your scriptures with me?